All right, let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining. Happy Tuesday. Excited to have you all here. Uh, my name is Rudy Karnick. I'm from the Encore Coordinating Center, and I will be facilitating today's presentation. Today's Connect and Explore webinar will dive into a new set of resources from Encore aimed to improve research on children at high risk for obesity. We are joined by Leticia Moore from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, who will provide background on the decision tree, case studies, and new resource list. We are also joined by three authors of the case studies who will walk us through how to apply, adapt, or develop a measure. We'll hear from Drs. Melissa Witt-Glover, Stella Yee, and Teresia O'Connor about their case studies. If you have a question for our speakers during the webinar, please write it in the chat box on the right side of your screen. If you need technical assistance, please let us know using the chat box. If you're having trouble logging into the webinar, please email us at encore at fhi360.org and we'll work with you to resolve the problem. We'll also be live tweeting during the webinar. If you're on Twitter, we encourage you to join the conversation by using the hashtag ConnectExplore and following at Encore on Twitter. To start things off, we'd like to open up with a couple of poll questions. You can submit your answer directly on the screen. Let us know who you are. Select the best option that describes you. Practitioner, researcher, student, public health professional, or other. Additionally, tell us what communities you work with. You can select all that apply. American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian American, Black or African American, Hispanic or Latinx, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. All right, thanks so much for joining. It seems like we have about a, a little more than a third of folks are public health professionals, about a quarter are researchers. We've got some practitioners and students in the house. Um, it also seems like you all work with a lot of the populations that we mentioned, specifically Black and African-American and Hispanic and Latinx, as well as Asian-Americans. Thanks for sharing. And now I'm going to pass it over to Leticia, who will discuss the background of this project. Good afternoon. It's such a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to talk about NCORE's new tool, Measures for Children at High Risk for Obesity, Choosing Whether to Apply, Adapt, or Develop a Measure. Next slide. So this work has occurred over several years with the help of a variety of of federal and non-federal partners. When we started this work, it was thinking about the fact that children and their families at high risk for obesity are often underrepresented in validation studies. This is important because as we're doing intervention studies or research, we're using a tool and we're assuming that it's going to capture the concept that we're interested in. And if we've taken a tool that has been used in other populations, we're not sure if it'll perform exactly the same way in a high risk population as it did in the population it was developed for. So it's really important to INCORE and to research and intervention work that we have culturally and linguistically appropriate instruments to ensure that the research and the concepts that we're measuring are being captured the way that we think they are. In 2013, the Institute of Medicine did an assessment of our NCORE measures registry. This registry hosts nearly 1400 articles and measures on obesity related measures like diet, physical activity, and the environments that influence healthy eating and active living. But 
they found very few that are focused on high-risk populations. We updated their assessment in 2019, looking at the NCORE's measures registry again that had been updated with more measures as the field itself moved forward. And we found that less than one in five were either used in a high-risk population, adapted specifically for that population, or specifically developed for high-risk populations. From 2013, when the Institute of Medicine did their assessment, to 2019, when we did an updated assessment, we did notice some things were improving. There were more measures available for African-American and Hispanic populations. But like in 2013, we found some serious gaps in the literature. More specifically, there are very few, if any, measures available for Asian populations, for American Indians and Alaskan Natives, for Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, in spite of there being higher prevalence of overweight and obesity in some of these populations. Doing this type of work, we really were concerned about the lack of measures and the ability to capture more so that people did not have to continue to develop measures. Next slide, please. So NCORE did two different things. The first one I've already mentioned, we did a gap assessment of all the existing obesity measures that are available in the field. We looked to see whether the measures in the NCORE register and a few other key resources were either applied to a high-risk population, so there was a measure that exists and it was used in that group, if there was an existing measure and it was tweaked just a little bit to make it more relevant to a population, and then measures that were specifically developed for high-risk population. And we captured all the underlying methodology of how researchers said they did that in this assessment. The second thing we did was host an expert panel and a workshop using this information that we developed from the gap assessment. The workshop was called Advancing Measurement for High-Risk Populations and Communities Related to Childhood Obesity. We invited experts and practitioners from all over the country to help us identify priorities and develop guidance to advance measurement in childhood obesity. Next slide. One of the things that came out of this workshop is a decision tree that we're going to spend the majority of our time on this webinar talking about. This decision tree is guides people through a variety of prompts to help you answer key questions at key times during your study design phase. So I'm going to spend just a bit of time walking you through some of the questions that this tool asks you. Next slide. So it starts asking you, do you have a research question? And it doesn't stop at just, do you have a question? It is, is it important to the community that you're studying? If the answer is no, that's when our first case study comes in. This case study walks you through how to involve human community members and stakeholders in your research and evaluation. If you already have a research question and you know that it's important to the community that you're trying to help and study, then we ask you to think about, do you know what you need to measure to address your question? Is it walking minutes per week? Is it times per day they drink sugar sweetened beverages? Again, if the answer is no, we have a variety of resources that can help you figure out what measures are available and whether they're appropriate for you. For example, the NCORE Measures Registry has user guides that walks you through, again, some of these key concepts you should be aware of as you're designing studies and learning modules. Next slide. So once you have your study question, you know it's of interest to the community, and you know what measure you want to focus on, the next part of the tool talks about, is it validated in the population that you are specifically interested in working in? If the answer is, yo, if the answer is yes, then we want to talk you through if you are being adapted, if it needs to be adapted. If the answer is no, then is, this, is there a measure available in any population? If that's yes, we can talk about how to apply a measure to use in a different population with case study four. If there's no such measure anywhere, 
Case study five allows you to talk about, it talks about how to develop a measure for a research, a new measure for a research population. If there already is a validated measure in your population, it doesn't need to be adapted, we encourage you to use it. If not, there's a case study that can walk you through how to compare populations to determine if they're meaningfully different. Next slide. So in total, as you walk through these questions in the decision tree, there are five different case scenarios. And these cover from the very beginning of when you're conceptualizing your study and your question about involving appropriate stakeholders to how to develop a new measure. Next slide, please. Before we get into more depth in depth about the case studies from my other panelists, I just also want to point out that NCORE has a variety of other resources that might make your lives a bit easier, such as guides that talk about adapting measures and example articles that we think maybe have done this well and may be of use to you. So we hope you would use look through those resources and look through them as you're developing your own work. Next slide. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Melissa Witt Glover, who's going to talk about one of the case studies. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'm gonna talk about case study number four, which is um, how to apply a measure to a different population. Uh, and this is based on some uh, work we did with an intervention study a few years back. Um, pleased to be here representing um, the Council on Black Health uh, at Dornsife uh, School of Public Health at Drexel University and also Gramercy Research Group. Next slide. Um, so what we, uh, so, so this uh, I think is to Leticia's um, presentation previously, this is where um, our case study fits within the decision tree that how to apply a measure for use in a different population. Next slide. So the rationale for um, this case study was, uh, we know that regular physical activity participation is linked with uh, a multitude of health benefits ranging from reducing chronic disease to improving overall quality of life, reducing uh, stress and things like that. What we also know from um, national uh, data is that most adults aren't achieving the national physical activity recommendations of at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity physical activity. We're also aware from data that uh, with regard to physical activity participation, there are differences in the amount of physical activity uh, po population subgroups obtain with disparities existing by gender, so women um, less active than men, race, ethnicity, um, when you're looking at um, leisure time physical activity um, questionnaires, uh, racial and ethnic uh, minority population subgroups are less active than white populations, and then by personal characteristics, so things like um, income, um, weight, uh, geography, some of those things can impact physical activity participation. All of those groups that have lower levels of physical activity also tend to have higher rates of the chronic diseases or the poor health outcomes that are associated uh, with physical activity and that could um, be improved by physical activity. And so uh, effective interventions are needed to work on improving physical activity in the groups that are least active. Next slide. What we also know is that a lot of the information that we collect about physical activity is recall, particularly when we're trying to collect that information in large populations. Um, this slide just represents um, the, the um, notion that we all feel very, very busy. And at the end of the day, most of us are exhausted. Um, and if, you, uh, if, if we ask people, you know, what are they doing in terms of engaging in activity, they might say things like, well, I'm running errands, I'm doing, I'm doing yard work, I'm participating in lots of meetings, I'm back and forth. But if you really think about the types of activities that we're doing, even though we are busy, many of the activities that used to be um, um, more active are things that we can do now, we can accomplish them while still remaining sedentary. And so the idea is how do you get um, good recall of physical activity participation so you can get a good estimate of, of 
of engagement and physical activity um, while still keeping, uh, getting people to um, keep reality in mind. Next slide. So we were um, interested in, um, in assessing physical activity for an intervention that we were conducting among African-American women. And we wanted to identify um, a survey or a tool to measure physical activity that we could use both to screen our participants to see who was eligible um, for our study. We, uh, we were recruiting women who were not meeting physical activity guidelines and we wanted that assessment to be um, accurate. But we also wanted to um, use the questionnaire to be able to um, supplement our objective measures of physical activity throughout the program. So we wanted a survey that could assess pre-program physical activity that could be self-reported, that could work for women who were low active, um, who may not accurately um, asset, be able to assess physical activity, particularly things that are done during the day that might not be labeled as traditional exercise. We wanted something that was sensitive to change. We wanted to be able to capture lots of different types of physical activity. So in addition to leisure time physical activity, we wanted to take into account occupational activity, transportation, gardening, many of the different types of activities that um, we know from research that, um, th that other groups, that groups tend to do that may not be traditional exercise. And we also, again, wanted to make sure that people could accurately recall um, activity, both in terms of intensity level, bout length, and total time. Next slide, please. So we were familiar with and had used before the um, International Physical Activity Questionnaire short form um, and knew from our work that that was a survey that uh, didn't require a long time to uh, to complete, um, but that did allow participants to um, assess their physical activity. We also knew that there were some challenges with folks being able to accurately recall information. And so we decided to um, modify that questionnaire slightly for our survey. And so this uh, table just represents um, the original IPAC or International Physical Activity Questionnaire and then our modifications. And so you can see some of the things that we did to modify is Rather than uh, we were recruiting participants over uh, about a one and a half year period for our study, and lots of interesting things were happening while we were recruiting. And uh, I live in North Carolina, and so things like you know half an inch of snow can can uh, can stop us for long periods of time. And so we were running into different issues throughout the, the year. And so rather than asking our participants about the last seven days, because sometimes things happen, we asked them about their usual week. You can see in terms of the, um, in, because we want to get usual physical activity, in terms of the activity type, um, for the original IPAC, it was vigorous, moderate walking and sitting. We asked about vigorous activity and then daily walking. And then we also added in a question about brisk walking specifically and moderate activity. We didn't add in the sitting um, category. Um, in terms of frequency, we did ask about days per week, but instead of making that an open-ended question, we had check boxes from zero to seven. And then for the duration of physical activity in terms of minutes per day, again, instead of asking about that as a categorical variable, we asked, I mean, as a, an open-ended variable, we asked it as a categorical variable um, uh, and we um, listed the minutes as zero, um, 15 to, um, 15 to 30, 30 to 45, 45 to 60, and over 60. We also were very specific, similar to the um, IPAC questionnaire and asking about 10 minute bouts of physical activity. We were, during the recruitment process, we spent a lot of time talking to participants to help them understand the study. We walked through what the guidelines would be um, and um, gave people information and a chance to ask questions before we started the pre-screen. We wanted to make sure that the pre-screen questionnaire was accurate. And we also wanted to model um, appropriate physical activity behavior. So uh, by the time we finished the first set of information, providing information um, about the study, participants had been sitting for about 20 minutes or so. And so we introduced um, a 10 minute physical activity break called instant recess, um, which was developed by the late Dr. Tony Yancey at UCLA which is 10 minute exercise breaks that are um, able to be done anywhere, anytime by anyone in any clothing. They're low impact, um, moderate intensity activities. 
we um, ask participants to do that as a way to not only break up a long bout of sitting, but to kind of get them to get a sense of this is what a 10 minute bout of physical activity actually feels like. Um, we had participants do that and then we had them sit back down and complete the questionnaire. Um, and, then, um, and then after that, we did a brief discussion with participants about physical activity, which gave us a chance to um, calculate their physical activity um, to assess their eligibility. Next slide. So lessons learned from that, um, it worked really well. And so one, of, so, so some of the interesting things we learned is that when we had participants engage in a 10 minute activity bout before they um, answered a questionnaire, it helped folks to understand what 10 minutes actually felt like and what moderate intensity felt like. Typically at about the two or three minute mark of the routine, people thought that it had been 10 minutes. And so we really were able to impact um, how people answered the questionnaire accurately. Um, we also were able to model healthy behavior as a part of our recruitment process. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but by asking about usual physical activity, it helped us um, help participants to recall their physical activity and avoided questions about, well, something weird happened last week, do I have to count that? And then finally, our close-ended questions helped to decrease the time that it took to um, complete the questionnaire. It helped to reduce the number of responses that were completely um, out of what would be considered the norm, and it helped us to be able to um, quickly and accurately and efficiently um, assess physical activity. Um, so I think next slide, I think that was my last slide, but um, that was an example of a case study and happy to take questions now or whenever uh, the time comes and my contact information is there. So thank you. Hi, thank you, Melissa, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to share our work with you today, and uh, thanks to the Encore team for this wonderful opportunity. Next slide, please. So today I will be presenting on the case study that we prepared for Encore, describing the process that we undertook to culturally adapt a validated diet screener, and also delineate some key questions that you can ask yourself if you are planning and preparing to conduct an adaptation yourself. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to start off my talk with this framing to stave off any misconceptions about the Asian American community. Asian Americans are a community of color and a health disparities population. And they have unique dietary habits such as high sodium and low whole grain intake, but also high seafood and low sugary drink consumption, which then tie into specific cardiometabolic disparities, including a high and increasing prevalence of diabetes, high cholesterol, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, heart disease, stroke, and COVID-19. And in New York City, where much of our work is focused, Asian Americans have similar or higher poverty rates than other racial ethnic minorities. Next slide, please. So despite these disparities, very little is known about Asian American dietary habits. So for example, on a recent search I undertook of federal websites on information pertaining to Asian American diet, I found this example that was meant to serve an, as, as an example of what a typical Asian diet consists of. And on cursory glance, uh, you can kind of conclude that this is not an accurate reflection of the different Asian subgroups that are included under the monolithic category of Asian American. So on the right-hand side of the slide is a non-existent list of countries. And if you were to report one of these as your country of origin, you would be categorized as Asian American in the United States. And I mention all this to remind you of the diversity of the Asian American community, but also to underscore that we're really at a time when there's a tremendous opportunity to advance the field when it comes to meaningful racial ethnic inclusion and representation in health research. And I'd lastly like to add that the concern about monolithic categorization does not apply only to Asian Americans, but to all racial ethnic groups. So it's something we should be mindful of as we collectively move forward and think about cultural adaptations. Next slide, please. So here lies the rationale for much of the work we do at the NYU Center for the Study of Asian American Health or NYU CESA. We are a National Institutes of Health, National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities funded center of excellence, entering our 18th consecutive year of funding. 
And in our nearly two decades of experience, we have been culturally adapting evidence-based interventions, measures, tools, and materials for the Asian American and other immigrant communities supported by a network of over 70 community-based organization partners across the country with the majority located in the New York City metropolitan area. Next slide, please. So the purpose of today's presentation is to describe the process of culturally adapting a validated diet screener for use in the English speaking Asian American population. And this was work that was conducted as a part of an NYU CISA funded pilot project that was led by Dr. Pasquale Rumo, who I know is on the call today, and assistant professor in the Department of Population Health at um, NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Next slide, please. So Pasquale was very interested in conducting an online survey to understand online grocery shopping behaviors in a national sample of Asian Americans. And as a part of his survey, he also wanted to collect good dietary, good quality dietary data from his study participants. However, a review of the existing literature revealed that no validated dietary screener currently exists that was specifically tailored to the diets of Asian Americans. So guided by the National Cancer Institute's register of validated short dietary assessment instruments, he selected the Dietary Screener Questionnaire or DSQ, which had been previously administered in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey or NHANES in the 2009-10 survey wave. So this is a similar process that might be undertaken using the decision tree and the NCORE measures registry for those of you interested in adapting an alternative instrument. Next slide, please. The first step in our process was to specify who the research participants would be. In other words, you might wanna ask yourself who your end user is. Um, some characteristics that you might want to consider include age, race, ethnicity, or acculturation level. And in our case, because Pasquale was administering his survey online, we conjectured that our eventual survey participants would be younger to middle-aged and Asian American. And because we were administering the survey in English only, that they would have a modest to high level of acculturation to US society. So here it was a combination of the sampling design, the budgetary considerations and capacity that helped guide to what degree we wanted to adapt the measure. Next slide, please. Next, you can ask yourself um, how specific do you want your measure to be? So in this case, we considered what Asian subgroups we wanted to be inclusive of, but also importantly, who we had within our partner network to ask for assistance in adapting the measure for that subgroup. And there are pros and cons to being very specific versus general. So for example, we could have opted to say we wanted to adapt the measure only for Chinese Americans and to administer the survey amongst Chinese Americans only. This of course would allow for a greater specificity in the cultural examples we used and perhaps have allowed for some of the money for the project to be allocated towards linguistic translation. Um, however, this would have limited the broader utility of the DSQ for other groups in the long run. On the other hand, um, we, could adapt, we could have adapted it for multiple subgroups. And of course the gold standard would have been to make the measure applicable to all Asian subgroups but um, this could lead to long-winded or confusing questions. So in our case, we opted for a compromise, which was to adapt the measure for the six largest Asian subgroups, which comprise about 85% of the Asian American population. So these groups were Chinese, Filipino, Asian Indian, Korean, Vietnamese, and Japanese. Next slide, please. The next step would be to assess who amongst your networks can help with the adaptation, or in other words, for what subgroups can you support a valid cultural adaptation? So this step really goes in concert with the prior step because of course you can't claim to adapt a measure for a subgroup without having the content and cultural expertise to do so. So in our case, we drew from our networks of community academic and government partners and identified between one to four individuals per Asian subgroup that could help to review. And those individuals are listed on this slide here. Overall, overall, Pasquale and I, and I'm Korean American, worked with Rhea Naik, who is Asian Indian, who was um, Pasquale's research coordinator, and the, and the reviewers that are on the slide. And any non-NYU reviewers were offered an incentive of $35. Next slide, please. Pasquale and Rhea then compiled all the responses from the reviewers and complemented with online databases and some Google searching 
um, developed a modified set of DSQ questions. And uh, led by Dr. Jeanette Beasley, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at our, at our school, and guided by the Frame Implementation Science Framework for Cultural Adaptation, we also retrospectively documented our adaptation process, which will allow us and others to re replicate this process for other subgroups. Next slide, please. Very briefly in terms of results, um, 15 of the 26 DSQ questions were modified. And in some cases, um, examples of prompts were added. So for example, for the fried potatoes question, culturally specific examples were added. Or in other cases, the description of the food was modified. So for sauces, the original question asks about tomato sauce on spaghetti or noodles, but we added or puree and stir fry with vegetables as an additional prompt. The team also noted that seafood was missing in the DSQ, which is problematic given that um, prior literature has shown that Asian Americans have high levels of seafood consumption. So we opted to add this question to capture seafood intake. Next slide, please. So that was a very brief snapshot of our process um, and more information is forthcoming in publications that are being led by Pasquale, Jeanette and myself. Um, these are our next steps. Jeanette is actually leading a validation of our adapted screener for the Chinese American population specifically using the ASA 24 and guided by bilingual Mandarin Cantonese community health workers. And I am also working with a team now to culturally adapt the DSQ for the US Latinx community. And here, similarly, we are in discussions about which specific countries and subgroups we are interested in tailoring this for. Uh, next slide, please. So these are my funding sources and contact information, and I look forward to answering any of your questions. And I will now turn it over to Teresia to speak about new measure development. Wonderful, thank you so much. So my name is Tracy O'Connor. I'm a pediatrician and behavioral researcher at Baylor College of Medicine, which is in Houston, Texas. Um, next slide, please. I'm gonna be talking specifically about case study five, which is how to develop a new measure for a research evaluation uh, or evaluation project. And I'm gonna be focusing on physical activity in um, Latinx or Latino preschool age kids. Next slide, please. So it's actually really nice because um, a lot of what Dr. Wicklover talked about in terms of influences of physical activity among adults clearly apply to uh, children as well. Um, and so I think it helps frame why we were interested in this problem um, or issue uh, among Latin, uh, Latino preschool age kids as well. So as most people on this call probably are already aware, Latino children are at much higher risk for obesity than a lot of other populations in the United States. What you may not be aware is that um, the uh, Latino or Hispanic population is in Houston is over 40%. So it really is a large group of the patient population that I care for and the communities in which we serve um, here in Houston and in Texas. And when you think about why uh, Latino kids and preschool age kids are at, at a higher risk for uh, obesity, um, it's clear that there's a great number of health disparities that they encounter. Uh, and several of them um, are regarding um, uh, opportunities and access and motivation for physical activity. So the uh, neighborhoods in which kids live in, the safety of those neighborhoods may influence how active kids are. The availability of venues for kids to be active um, certainly influences their physical activity. How and if their parents engage and encourage them to be active. And then cultural beliefs and attitudes about physical activity for kids uh, may influence uh, children's uh, physical activity behaviors. So we were really interested in understanding how these uh, uh, different uh, variables influence and interact with each other. Next slide, please. So in a um, study that we were conducting, uh, this was a few years ago now, um, we looked at all the variables that we were interested in among Latino preschool age kids and um, sort of what tools were available for us to assess those variables. So in this study to assess um, neighborhood, cultural, uh, as well as parental influences on children's uh, physical activity, 
Um, the variables we were interested in was obviously the outcome measure of children's physical activity. And we made the decision um, to use accelerometers to measure uh, this. They were established protocols already in place. As a team, we already had experience with using physical uh, accelerometers to measure preschool and elementary school age children's physical activity. So it was a nice tool for us to use. For the geographic descriptors of the neighborhoods in which kids uh, lived in, um, we had GIS available data that we could incorporate. And from the neighborhood safety standpoint, we were actually able to uh, obtain city level crime and traffic safety data uh, that we could layer on to the other GIS data that we had. And for parental perception of the neighborhoods, which may be different than what the actual uh, crime and um, safety data suggests from the city, uh, there were validated surveys available that we can use that had been used in other low income and ethnic minority populations in other parts of the country. And for cultural variables, we were particularly interested in acculturation and familism. Again, there were validated uh, instruments available that we could um, use. But where we really struggled when we started this project was physical activity parenting practices. And parental influences on children's behaviors is something that I've been interested in since I started in this field. And uh, parenting practices are really those behaviors that parents engage in to try to um, encourage or motivate their child um, in a specific context. Um, next slide, please. And when you look at uh, the physical activity parenting practice scales that were available when we started this study, most of them were intended and developed for older children. And we didn't think that was appropriate for our study for a couple of different reasons. One is that um, elementary school and middle school age children engage in different physical activities than preschool age kids. Um, preschool age kids also require supervision in a much different way. So have parents engage with them to get uh, that three to five year old age group active is very different than older kids. And then just from a developmental standpoint, what kids can and should be doing is very different in the three to five year old age group than in older um, age groups. Additionally, when you looked at the physical activity parenting practice scales that were out there, they were not developed for Latino families. They were developed for other population, primarily for middle class white uh, families. And um, we knew based on what other groups had published um, in the United States and, and other countries, as well as our own work, that there are cultural influences on how parents and children interact. And that Latino parents may be more protective uh, for their kids than other uh, uh, ethnic groups. Um, and so, and additionally, there may be different cultural influences on how parents engage with boys and girls and physical activity within the Latino community that may be different than in other cultural groups. And none of the existing parenting practice scales were available in Spanish at the time. So based on this, um, next slide, we decided that while there were existing parenting practice scales out there, none of them were really appropriate for us to adapt to use in our population, which is why we came to the decision that we really needed to develop one from the ground up. And very importantly, and um, as I think Dr. Moore did a nice job in her introduction, talking about how important it is to engage with your community and with stakeholders um, when working within communities. So we really wanted to um, work with Latino parents who had preschool age kids and helping us develop this uh, new survey. We also wanted to engage with researchers and experts in parenting to make sure that we're capturing important concepts that others think uh, are important. And I think when you, when you think about developing these kinds of um, survey um, or other tools from the ground up, um, this piece of how to engage with stakeholders, uh, whether or not it be um, the, the population that you are targeting, whether it be leaders in that community or other researchers and experts, I think qualitative formative interview, uh, sorry, studies are really key in systematically trying to um, use the very important information that these stakeholders can give you and make sense of it at the end of the day so that you can apply it to the instrument that you are trying to develop. 
And, and I think just from a very broad strokes, the, the types of qualitative formative work that um, public health workers and uh, researchers can look at doing are interviews, focus groups, or open-ended surveys. And in, in reality, we've used all three of those in different studies that we've done. For this particular study, we elected to use a very specific type of uh, focus group technique called nominal group technique. And for those that aren't familiar with it, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it, but it's really a structured multi-group procedure that allows um, someone to engage with a group of people to generate a list of answers or ideas in response to a question. And for us, that was really ideal um, when it came to uh, this uh, kind of research that we were doing. Next slide, please. And so, we engaged um, five sets of focus groups um, uh, of, with Latino parents and asked uh, five of them what they do to encourage physical activity for their child and five of them what they do to discourage physical activity for their child. And we stratified it by the parent education as well to make sure that the people that they were engaging with in these conversations um, were similar to themselves. We also considered uh, what we learned from these uh, focus groups against what's published in the literature, and we generated a list of 38 items of parenting practices that Latino uh, parents engage in to either encourage or discourage physical activity. Next slide, please. So we then conducted a cross-sectional study of 240 Latino parents. We looked at the factor structure, the test retest reliabilities, and the internal reliabilities of the resulting questionnaire. And we, in a subsample of this uh, cross-sectional study, also looked at the association of children's physical activity as measured by accelerometers. And in the results through these studies, uh, we ended up with a 38 item um, uh, survey to look at preschool physical activity parenting practice scale. Next slide, please. And I, I think important um, looking back at this, because it's now been a couple of years since we did this work, what lessons did we learn? Um, I think getting the parents engaged in the focus group was so important for us because we identified novel parenting behaviors from that work that really hadn't been published prior to that. And uh, we also learned about important constructs that we hadn't really considered uh, in the past. So um, the thinking about um, psychological control uh, was really important. Um, and from parenting uh, preschool age kids, one of the things that came up were um, inactive uh, type or, or behaviors that parents engaged in that promoted inactivity in kids. So if you're out for a walk with your child, pushing them in the stroller instead of letting them walk for themselves, which really hadn't been part of any of these scales in the past. But there were also other lessons learned. So nominal group technique was great in generating ideas and a list. And it also allowed the participants to help us rank order what was important in their mind um, within this list. But it didn't allow us to explore um, reasons for using these parenting practices and, and other sort of important values and attitudes that may influence these. And I think that's worth looking at more in the future. And also really importantly, when we did this work, we were still very focused on moms. And looking back at it now, I wish we would have engaged fathers more in our formative work as well. And I think it was a real missed opportunity because it's clear that dads are really important in engaging children in physical activity as well. And I think we, we could have enhanced our scale even further if we would have engaged dads from the get-go. Next, next slide, please. Um, and uh, I'm adding here, and this is uh, on the website as well, a list of, or the uh, resulting publication um, and how to sort of uh, describe in a little bit more detail on the the website uh, as to how we go about or went about uh, using uh, the formative work to develop this uh, scale. Next slide. And a list of publications that are uh, uh, resulted from this work. Um, and I think it's um, helpful to see that it's not a one-time thing. This took multiple years and, and multiple steps to really develop a scale that has been useful for us for our work uh, for the original study that we did. And in addition, we're using in other studies and others have now subsequently used in some of their studies. Next slide, please. 
And I think my contact information is here if anybody uh, needs to get a hold of me or has any other questions, but I think we're gonna do questions for the group next. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Teresia, and to all of our wonderful speakers. Lots of great information. Um, you guessed it, it is now time for our Q&A. Um, so if we will try our best to get to all the questions, but if there are any remaining, we will ask our speakers to respond in writing and we will include these in the follow-up email that we'll be sending to all of our participants in today's program. So for our first question, how do I get started with a community partner? And Stella or Teresia, maybe one of you can answer that. Yeah, sure. I think I think uh, Malisha could also speak to this as well. Um, this is often a question that, that we get because it it you know I'm talking about like the network we have and we have like 70 partners and it's it can be somewhat overwhelming. But I think that really starting in a very like grassroots kind of way, you know, if you are thinking about a particular population that you're interested in working with or or meeting with, um, just reaching out and looking in a geographic area that you're interested in in serving, um, reaching out and seeing what community-based organizations exist, and 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 at least in New York City, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sure this is the case for other places too, based on the diversity of people that you guys say that you're interested in in helping. Um, in New York City, you know, it is very dependent. The geography very much dictates the populations that we end up working with. So. Um, you know, going into a particular neighborhood in Brooklyn, you could be working with Russian speaking immigrants, you could be working with Arab Americans, you could be working with um, Chinese Americans or, or Mexican Americans. Um, so it really is good to number one, be specific and number two, just to reach out to different organizations that are within the neighborhood that you're interested in working with and just sitting down and having a chat and seeing if you have sort of um, seeing what, what health needs that, you know, they're actually, I just had one today. We had a call with a new, um, potential partner at a faith-based organization in, in a, in a neighborhood in Brooklyn. And it was wonderful. We just talked about our work and talked about whether or not we had similar, similar priorities or what, and what you there and apply for the grants together and you do all of that. Um, so I don't know if Malisha or Teresia, you have anything to add to that. Sure. This is Malisha. I'll just add um, two, two points. I, I agree with everything you said, Stella. And I'll just also add to get started with the population. My advice is um, don't let the first time the population sees you be when you're asking them for something. So be present, be engaged with the population throughout because a lot of times, particularly as researchers, we think about the population once we already have funding and we need something from them. We don't often, um, we don't often provide um, any resources. And so to that point, my second um, piece of advice is don't, don't let every time you come to them be because you need something. So, um, and I think we, we often forget about that. And I guess the final thing I'll say is if you are engaging with the population um, and, they, and they do work with you and they do provide information, please make sure that you loop back and you help um, to disseminate the information. You translate um, not just in an academic journal, um, but you translate the findings and help the population to understand how they and that organization and community to understand how they contributed to moving the research in the field forward and the learnings. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And, and um, I, I think those are really key uh, points of giving back as well. And, and one of the things we've tried to do is partner with other um, organizations. That, so we partner with them on a professional level, but um, I think additionally on a personal level, finding time to then go and volunteer in those organizations and see how you can give back uh, uh, is equally important as well. So not just on your professional front, but trying to to engage privately as well can be really helpful. Um, but, but I think, uh, you know, really uh, finding ways that it's a collaboration where you're helping each other uh, is key and it's not just going to them for research projects. Thank you so much. That was really great advice from everyone. Our next question is, could the panelists comment on whether funding agencies and reviewers are receptive to allocating a portion of grant budgets to measures adaptation, or should these should these efforts be in place before investigators seek funding? 
Teresa, so, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, so I, my experience is that we've gotten um, several projects um, funded in which one of our aims uh, of the grant was adaptation. Um, of an instrument. Uh, so for example, the, the project that I just presented with Latino preschool children, um, one of our aims was the development of that physical activity parenting practice scale as part of the larger study. Um, and we've similarly had other times in which we validated um, existing surveys um, for new populations um, and uh, uh, additionally validating, or sorry, adapting existing programs for new populations. Um, so my experience has been, the key is that providing a really specific plan as to how you go about doing it, using a conceptual framework is extremely helpful so that you can ground it in theory and um, help reviewers understand what you're trying to do with each step of adaptation. Yeah, I would, I would completely agree with Teresia. Um, I would say actually the majority of our research studies have a cultural adaptation aim in them. Um, I think to tie it back to the prior question, um, one thing that funders are perhaps less sensitive to is the amount of legwork and kind of boots on the ground work you have to do to build the partner trust and the relationships. And I think that that's changing a little bit. I have seen more funding opportunities that are like, oh, you know, like a planning grant or formative research kind of kind of grant, but um, the cultural adaptation, though, I think generally speaking, is is pretty well accepted, acceptable by funders. Thank you so much. Our next question, and feel free to jump in, whoever can answer this. What are those top three messages parents can encourage and discourage for physical activity in kids? I um, so some of, of that, I, I don't think it's as clear as that because I think it depends on a lot of other contextual information. Um, uh, but you're um, in the papers that I reference, and you can find those references on the NCOR site as well. Um, you can look where we actually rank ordered uh, what the different parents' uh, focus groups. Uh, thought were most important, but what parents think are most important and what actually are associated with children's measured physical activity may be slightly different as well. Um, and so one of our other papers uh, references some of that. Um, I, you know, a lot of the work um, uh, for kids in general is, uh, role modeling and providing logistic support for kids is extremely important to, to get them to be active. And um, psychological control um, uh, tends to not be very uh, <laughs> helpful uh, in terms of uh, engaging kids in physical activity. It may actually have the opposite intended effect. Um, but those are sort of broad strokes there. You can find more details in the publications if you're interested. And I'm happy to carry on a conversation by email or uh, otherwise, if that's helpful. Thanks so much, Teresia. So in the interest of time, it seems like we have to wrap up our Q&A portion. But if we did not get to your question today, don't worry, we will get the answer and, and include that in our follow-up after this event. And now to some upcoming events for Encore. Our next webinar in this Connect and Explore series will be held on February 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Learn about NCORE's latest projects, tools, and resources, and hear directly from NCORE members. You can register at the link here and we'll post the link to our social media pages as well. Students, be sure to sign up for our newsletter to be the first to know about upcoming events, including these webinars. You can also check out NCORE Student Hub webpage at ncore.org slash student hub. NCORE recently published the final white paper in a series of three on advancing measures for childhood obesity research. These white papers came from a series of three workshops aimed at defining next steps and measurement needs to accelerate progress and reducing childhood obesity. The workshops were funded as part of NCORE's strategic alliance with the JPB Foundation and were held in 2019 and early 2020. You can find all the white papers on the NCORE website. 
If you have used or plan to use NCORS tools, including the resources discussed today, make sure to tell us how at NCORE at FHI360.org, and you could end up being a featured speaker on the next webinar. If you have questions about NCORE or upcoming activities, please email the NCORE Coordinating Center at NCORE at FHI360.org. To access the recording of this webinar, click webinars on the top navigation of our website. All the upcoming and archived webinars are displayed there. A link will also be sent to the email address you used to register for this webinar. Thank you again to Drs. Moore, Wick, Glover, O'Connor, and Yee for joining this special webinar, and thanks to all of you who attended. When the webinar ends, please take a moment to complete our brief survey to help shape future webinars. Thanks again and have a great afternoon.